welcome back to another week of Vinyl Friday, the rumors mill. It is the first Friday of September, which means two things. One, that it's a Fleetwood Mac day, and two, that my birthday is this month. Yay! Are you excited about my birthday too? Now, to be fair, this is meant to be a Beatles week, but August this year had altogether too many Fridays. So as a compromise, I'm gonna be doing a short and sweet rumors mill and a general Q&A about Beatles stuff. So happy Friday, this is the first of those two videos. In my proposed sequencing for this album, we have just flipped the disc, which means that today we will be listening to this song. Never going back again. This song features a guitar part that is deceptively simple. I say deceptively because it sounds like it's multiple guitar parts layered on top of each other, but it's not, and that actually makes it really difficult to play. He's essentially doing the job of two guitarists at the same time. And if you don't believe me, we're going to be checking in with the guitar correspondent throughout this episode, as she is currently trying to learn the piece. At the moment with not much success, right guitar correspondent? Never Going Back Again was one of the last tracks that was recorded for the album. When they started recording it, producer Ken discovered that he liked the sound of Lindsay Buckingham's guitar within the first 20 minutes of it being restrung. So he proposed to Lindsay that they get a roadie to restring the guitar every 20 minutes for the recording, and they did this the entire day. In producer Ken's words, I quote, Restringing the guitar three times every hour was a bitch. <laughs> Just imagine how much they spent on all those strings as well, like three sets an hour for ten hours? Maybe that's where all the money was going. Well, that and the mountains of coke. After all of that, they came back the next day to run Lindsay's vocals and discovered that they had recorded all those guitar parts in the wrong key. It was way too high. I mean, when you listen to the outtake, Obviously it was in the wrong key. This is how high he would have had to sing it in that key. Been down one time, been down two time. Never go back so they scrapped all the work that they had done the day before, dispensed with the string changing, and just recorded it in the key that we hear it now. I think that that would have been grounds for the roadie to throttle both producer and musician. <laughs> Guitar correspondent, you're definitely playing it in the correct key, right? So here are some things I like about the song. For a start, I think it serves as a really nice counterpoint to the louder, ragier songs on the album, like Go Your Own Way. Go, go! Another thing is I think it's a really nice counter-argument for all of the people who feel that this album is overproduced and too slick. This is literally just Lindsay and his guitar. And while the recording is quite tidy, you could make the argument that it's entirely underproduced. Much like Songbird later in the album, this is a song that's about more than just the relationship between the lyrical subjects of the song. It's also about the relationship between the musician and the musician's instrument. It's like a a sweet, simple duet between the two. And as the listener, you can hear that relationship. I really enjoyed that about this song. The song revolves around a looping guitar part that's played in a Travis Picking style. Guitar correspondent, if I could interrupt you for a moment, can you please explain to us what Travis Picking is? Travis style is a style of finger picking named for Merle Travis in which a steady bass line is maintained with the thumb and the sort of melody treble part is played with the rest of the fingers. So in the case of this song, it sounds like where the bass line is that So as a songwriter, here's what I think is happening with this song. He's devised this beautiful riff. It sounds great on its own, but it really can't function on its own because it's a little too repetitive. So he's gone, I guess I'd better throw some lyrics and melody at it and turn it into a real song. But really the heart of the song is that delicate finger-picked guitar part. And you can sort of see that in the way that the song only has two verses of two lines each in a chorus that has just been down one time, been down two times, never going back again. So 
From that, we can surmise that Lindsay, at the very least, can count to two. But I think he did a good job, because as I said, the song really doesn't function as an instrumental piece. On the super deluxe release of this album, there are several outtakes of the instrumental part in its different iterations. And man, listening to two or three of them in a row without any of the vocals is boring. <laughs> I feel like the the melody and the lyrics that he's given the song add something to that guitar part without detracting from its beautiful melodicism. And the song did go through several iterations. Early on it was called Brushes because it was going to be played with Mick Fleetwood playing Brushes. Makes sense. Which sounded like this. They tried a version that had a three-part harmony. The Super Deluxe says it's a duet, but I'm fairly certain that's a three-part harmony. But I'm just some person on the internet. The earliest demo I can find features this lovely overdriven guitar, which I feel would have worked really well around the 2012-2013 stomp and holler craze. This is what the original sounds like. This is what I think it would have sounded like in 2013. <laughs> They ultimately opted, much like with Songbird, for minimalism. It is just Lindsay and just Lindsay's guitar. I like to think of this as a metaphor for Lindsay Buckingham's best qualities, both as a musician and as the sort of unofficial music director of Fleetwood Mac. He was obviously skilled, as evidenced by that quite tricky guitar part. Ah, I've got blisters on my fingers! But he doesn't necessarily draw attention to himself or show off a lot of the time. His solos are rarely very technical, but they are the right solo for the song. He's not using them as a kickoff point to show off his technical wizardry. This is the quality that I would like to highlight. Lindsay's work as an arranger and musician always serves the song. If a song calls for a part for which he is clearly overqualified, rather than overcomplicating that part, he will just lay down the recording at that level, if that is what's right for the song. Even if he wasn't the nicest guy about playing on his ex's songs, he always did a pretty good job. I've been a little bit hard on Lindsay in this series, maybe, a few of you have pointed out. Maybe my perspective is colored by the fact that he was incredibly stroppy to the point of violence in the studio while recording this. Like, I think he tried to strangle one of the producers at one point and he was constantly screaming at people. As I like to say, there's no excuse for being an asshole. But, to his credit, even if the circumstances were challenging, even if the playing was beneath him, he always does the right thing for the song. That is an important quality in a band member. He knows his place within the band. You know, if you're a solo musician, it doesn't really apply, but if you're in a band, you have two jobs. The first is to be able to play your instrument, and the second is to know your place within the band. Within the collective, Lindsay nails this, for the most part. Now, as a lot of you know, I've perhaps arrogantly proposed a better sequencing for this album than was released. I've chosen this song at this particular point because I think it should be track one of side B given that side A closes on the high melodrama of Silver Springs. This, I feel like, is the perfect palette cleanser and bridge between that song and the next. If you'd like to know what the rest of the sequencing looks like, I'll leave a link in the description to a playlist. Which I think makes it time for... Who won the breakup? Now, to the uninitiated, this album famously was written in the wake of pretty much everyone in the band going through a breakup, oftentimes with each other. In this, in this studio, in that room in there, in that tiny little room, there was, you know, five people that were totally breaking up. Because the bassist, John McVie, previously married to the keyboard player, Christine McVie, wasn't writing music, it doesn't really feel like we can adequately determine who won that breakup. But, in the interests of journalistic rigor, I do think it's worthwhile working out who won the breakup between Stevie Nicks and Lindsay Buckingham. After all, they're over it now. We did get over it. We all got over it, you know? So here's where we're standing on the leaderboard. We've had three Stevie songs, we've had two Lindsay songs, and Stevie is marginally ahead of Lindsay. We're using three metrics to determine who won this breakup. The first is personal growth. Is this a song motivated by pettiness 
or by growth and maturity. The second is general songwriting quality. Essentially, how good is this song? And the third metric is passion. Is the performance of this song tepid or fiery? With that said, let's go. For personal growth, I'm gonna give this song a neutral score because the lyrics are simply so vague that it is difficult to tell what he's singing about, other than to say that he's not going to repeat past mistakes. Lindsey Buckingham himself has admitted that the lyrics of this song aren't particularly profound, but they're also a far cry from shacking up song you won't do. So I'm gonna give him five for this. Sort of run of the mill, five. For songwriting, I'm gonna give this song a six and a half because it's a really good riff, but it doesn't really develop much beyond that riff. It's just the A part and the B part, and they just loop. They could loop indefinitely. There's no middle eight, there's no key change. There's not much development beyond that looping part. So six and a half for that. And as for passion, I'm gonna say another six and a half. The chorus is delivered from the gut. And the verses by comparison are a little bit neither here nor there. So where are we sitting now with those scores? Well boss, all up that gives Lindsay a solid six. This means that Stevie's running average is 6.15 and Lindsay's average is lagging behind at 5.7. The pettiness exhibited in secondhand news is really coming back to bite him in the butt. Back to you. So that's it for me. If you enjoyed this episode or you would like to support any of the weird things that I do, I'll leave a link in the description to my Buy Me A Coffee page where you are most welcome to make a donation if you wish. No pressure, friends. A massive thank you to everybody who has made donations or signed up as a member. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And if you're curious about what any of my original music sounds like, I will leave a link in the description to that as well. Thanks for hanging out with me. I'll see you here next week. Have a great weekend! And welcome back to an <coughs> Look at your little curled feet. Cute. Lindsay it is Lindsay is a Lindsay Buckingham himself Lindsay Buckingham himself. Lindsay Buckingham himself. Lindsay Buckingham himself.